Great. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. My name is Marty Mascari, and I am a contractor with the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging and the North Central Texas Aging and Disability Resource Center, or ADRC. Um, both of the programs are under the umbrella of the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Um, we are blessed once again to have our uh, partners at the James L. West Center here today, um, um, namely Jamie Cobb Tensley, to talk about types of grief. And so before we get started, I would like to, um, to first say something. We are, when you guys get the follow-up email to this, and I'll try to remember to say this again at the end, we have a, um, a presentation that we're doing in partnership with the James L. West Center later this month, and it's going to be in Spanish, and it's going to be um, um, nor um, normal versus not normal aging. And um, we just have a really hard time getting that word out to the Spanish-speaking people, and, and, and we'd love to have you guys help in, um, in, in forwarding that information to um, anybody that you know that might, um, that might benefit from it. We don't have a lot of people registered, and I just want to make sure we're reaching out to as many people and getting it. For those of you wanting that, that have um, asked for that in English, we have scheduled that now to do that in English in June. But um, later this month, it'll, it'll be in Spanish only. But if you could help us get that um, the word out on that, we would sincerely appreciate it. So, Jamie, can we advance a slide? And um, I'll talk about CEUs. Oh, you need to talk about CEUs. Sorry, these are your CEUs. Go ahead. No. <laughs> well, we are happy to offer CE credits for today's program. Um, we'll be offering um, one and a half hours for social work. Um, licensed counselors, nursing, and a certificate of attendance. These are specific to the state of Texas, um, but there is a survey monkey evaluation you must complete. Um, after the program today, it will be sent in that follow up email, um, but it is required that that um, survey monkey evaluation is completed for us to process those CE credits. And if you will please allow us about three to four weeks to process all those credits. And just please note that the um, evaluation and the link close um, next week on February the 22nd. So there is a deadline to get that in. Great. In addition to Jamie's uh, survey, the Survey Monkey survey, which again is required if you would like a certificate, a CEU or certificate of attendance, we are also asking if you'll fill out our Google survey. Um, and this helps us report back on the goals and objectives we set forth when we applied for the funding to bring you these webinars. Um, um, that should pop up as you close out today. And if it doesn't pop up, um, you will also receive that in a follow-up email as well. And so, Jamie, I'm turning it over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Marty. Um, we are very happy to be talking to you today about grief, right? Um, then this types of grief, really, what is this am I feeling? Um, and we're going to cover a lot of information. Some things I'll go through fairly quickly um, because I want to make sure that we get through the content. But I will say, um, Marty, thank you for talking about our Spanish speaking programs that are coming up. We would appreciate the help to get the word out there. Um, we know here at the James L. West Center, you know, we serve persons impacted by dementia. So that includes everybody, whether it's a person with a diagnosis, all the way up to their families, um, but to the support systems out there and community organizations and just community members that are here to support those families managing this disease. But also just how do I age to the best that I can absolutely age and understanding what is normal and not normal and then some steps to do next. So that is part of the programming we do here at the West Center. I'm very happy to partner with Marty um, and the North Texas Area Agency on Aging as well. But here on this slide is just a few more information or a little bit more information about us as the West Center. Um, and we're always here to answer any questions or share more about what we do um, with anybody that needs it. So I said, we are gonna cover a lot of different things. This first objective we're doing today is we are gonna talk about 15 different types of grief. But really we wanna describe what grief is, what does it look like, how do we work through it, how can I identify um, types of grief or grief symptoms in myself or maybe others as its clients I might be working with or family members, people that I love. And what is the impact of that grief? but how can I work through it in a healthy way um, and then be able to share my knowledge I have on grief with others. 
because grief is just a natural process. It's what happens after we have any type of loss, whether it's a loss of a, um, a death of somebody that we love. It can be a friendship loss. It can be a job. It can be income, um, retirement, right? The way the loss of a role or a career that we had. It can be a physical um, loss, whether it's a disability, loss of a child. I mean, there's just so many things, anything that we lose. It's a loss of something or someone, you know, and it can show up as this just kind of this dull ache that stays with us, or it can show up unexpectedly and it can really take over, take over our lives. But it's best to let grief happen. It's best for us to let it feel it and let it happen naturally. And that's a healthy way to grieve, to get through a loss of something or to, to live with a loss of something. And I love this because um, it talks about grief as a form of love. Um, grieving a loss of something or someone is a form of love. You know, tears can, can take shape in the form of tears and that's, it makes a place of words when there really are no words at times. But it's also, there's an act, there's um, actions and behaviors we go through um, that can be loving and express our love, but it can also be healing on our end as we are working through the loss. But it's letting go and it's learning to live with the loss. Notice I didn't say we're letting go and then moving on. We're learning to live with what was lost and how do we do that in a healthy way and move, uh, move forward in a healthy way. Sometimes grief um, will show up in physical manifestations and we're going to dive deeper into that because um, grief has to have a place to go. And sometimes we can be overwhelmed. So sometimes it might show up in physical symptoms. But this quote here at the um, this last bullet point, there is no end to grief. The goal is to adapt to the loss and incorporate grief into our life experience such that grief becomes integrated. So please remember that grief, um, losing somebody and grieving through it doesn't mean that you're forgetting it or it's something that you move on from. Grief will always be a part of us. It's how well we manage that and make it, um, incorporate that into our life experience and learn and grow from that. But also know there is no timetable for us to grieve. Um, there's no right or wrong way for us to grieve either. You know, there might you might realize that sometimes you feel better in a few weeks, but for other people, it might take years to work through, to work through grief. It is a long process and you will likely have setback, setbacks along the way. Um, so it might feel like sometimes you take, you know, one step to one step forward, two steps back, you know, one step forward, two steps back. And that's um, kind of the nature of grief as we go through this. I will preface this is that I'm not a counselor. I'm not a doctor. Um, I am a person, I'm a human being that has loss in my life, um, have grieved, have mourned, um, have bereaved as well. So somebody that's experienced this, <clears throat> but know that this is, um, is a natural part of who we are as human beings. And, uh, and hopefully today we understand a little bit, um, understand that better, have a better knowledge of it so we can work through it in a better way. So symptoms of grief. There are common symptoms of grief. Um, and you can see here on the graphic on the left here, there's anxiety, there can be agitation, irritation, having a hard time concentrating, numbness, um, feeling just, just feeling numb, I don't have any feelings. It can be sadness, it can be anger, being just disoriented. Um, a sense of disconnection from others as well. I just, and that can be a part of numbness, but I just don't feel connected to anyone or anything. Mm -hmm. There can be yearning and longing that we feel. Um, and we might even see us trying to do things for us to feel close to what we've lost, whether it was a person that maybe we lost to death, or we're trying to do things that get us back to, um, to reminders of what was lost. You know, the, the feelings that are symptoms of grief can be, can feel really hard. They can feel excruciating at times, and it can feel like sometimes it's never ending. You know, the anger, some confusion, difficulty, trying to return back to a normal routine can be very difficult. But grief is, it's what our, it's our body's way and it's our mind's way of trying to adjust to life without the loss. You know, it's, it's a way to accept our new reality 
and to build new meaning into our lives. So this grief work or working through the mourning and the bereavement is important, but it is work. So mourning, because we're using there's grief, there's mourning, there's loss, there's bereavement, and there's several different terms we're going to use. But mourning is really that external expression, or it's an act that we do. Um, it's how we act out our loss. It's how we act out our grief and our sadness, maybe the thoughts and feelings we have for a loss. It can involve rituals, um, something, you know, is wearing black. We go to the funeral. Um, we wear, maybe wear an armband. We do... Um, you know, sit bedside, we might light candles, we might go pray. It's those acts that we do to express our loss, express our love. Um, and it's, it's just that sadness that we are expressing externally after a loss that we have. But what is sadness, right? Um, so sadness is that feeling of sorrow or just being unhappy. And there's really a range of emotions um, or emotional states that you can have with sadness. It can be anything from mild disappointment all the way up to extreme despair or sorrow. Um, and you can see all those in between there. There's feelings of resignation. I'm feeling distraught. Maybe misery is in there. Helplessness, hopeless, all of those. It serves as a reminder um, that we need help and or we need comfort. And I really appreciate that statement um, because the sadness is a reminder that we don't have to do this alone um, and that there are ways that we can do this that are healthy and in a positive way. So it's looking at this sadness as, you know what, I'm going to, I need help or I need some comfort during these times, really, especially of extreme sadness that we're feeling. So what is loss, right? Loss is the fact. It's the that we did lose something or we did lose someone. You know, you just think about some of the things that we lose. Um, and maybe you think about some stuff in your past. What have we lost? There can be uh, marriages. Obviously, you know, there can be deaths of loved ones. There can be um, business, right? We have lost business. There can be loss of income. Um, income. There can be loss of normality. Right. I think back to the pandemic when lives, our normal lives, were lost, just our normal routines. And that was considered or can be considered a loss as well. You know, it can look like physical, um, or there can be sim physical symptoms, emotional and economical um, symptoms that can be really hard and they can be damaging as well. Losing possession of something, it might be a position, it might be an ability, a relationship an attribute. Um, you know, we might have lost trust in a system or lost, lost trust in a person. And it can also feel like deprivation or separ separation from a person, a place, a thing, a time. Mm -hmm. You know, part of grieving and some things we'll talk about is there is a grief exercise to look for grief patterns in yourself. Um, so if we list back in this, you know, this takes time. So I encourage you to do this later on today. But if you can go back and list all of the losses in your life as far back as you can remember, you know, from pets to maybe you moved houses when you were a little kid and lost some friends, you know, go back and think about all those losses you might have had and write those down. And then think about, well, how did I cope with those losses? What um, were there others around me that helped me cope, right? What did I put in place or what did other people put in place for me? And make a spreadsheet of this. And the purpose of this is to help us find a pattern in our grieving. And as we kind of see these patterns and what we um, kind of draw back on or fall back on on how we cope um, or, or lack of coping um, can help us move through grief and work through some of this grief work a little bit better um, in our present and in our future. So bereavement. Um, bereavement is it's the, um, it's the time, you know, it's a period of mourning. It's that period um, or time of the grief that we have. It's the experience that we're having of the loss. You know, it's the time where we process um, what is happening. We're processing the depth, um, the loss of something or someone and why we're deprived of that. It's a normal time, this bereavement that we go through. And it's 
um, expected to happen after any type of loss. It's the process. It's a response um, that we all have, um, psychological response of those who've suffered significant loss in their life and ensuing grief. Now, say there is no um, time limit for this. Like we said earlier, there's no timetable for grief, uh, but there's no time limit except for six months of complicated grief. Um, it, it is a time in which we are adjusting to living, um, living with the loss and realizing that it is real and that it is permanent. So it's that, that adjustment period, right? That processing it. You know, I think of um, uh, residents. If you're in a community, West Center is a community here. It's a loss of residents. Um, and as a healthcare worker or those that work with them and care give for them and their families, a loss of a resident may affect us more strongly and in different ways than it would affect their actually family member. The importance of a relationship um, with those that we care for, whether it's a I'm a one-on-one -on -one caregiver with my, you know, my spouse or a parent, or I'm a caregiver in a professional sense, it's that relationship that we formed. Um, that can um, have the significant impact of that loss that we have. And this bereavement period is this processing us through that loss so we can learn to live with the loss and accept the reality that that's not there anymore. And that's permanent. And how do we move through and incorporate that loss into our life experience? There's depression, you know, where we have grief, we have loss, mourning, bereavement, um, and always depression. The, the questions of depression come up, but, you know, depression is a common, um, and it's a very serious medical illness that negatively affects how we feel, the way we think, how we act. And there are feelings of um, severe de despondency, hopelessness and dejection. And it can happen at any age, but it does happen most often in adults. And if we think about depression, you know, what symptoms kind of automatically come to mind when I think about depression? You know, are there particular symptoms that we have? Maybe a lot, um, sadness is what comes to mind, right? This is one of those typical um, things that come in. Sleep changes might happen that come up. <clears throat> A loss of appetite, maybe apathy, loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness, um, can't focus anymore, you know, loss of interest in anything, um, the particular things that brought us joy, feelings of isolation, absolutely. Um, loss in, in kind of our lifestyle choices, maybe we're not eating as much or we're eating more than we used to, right? Um, feelings of not wanting to go on. We don't want to go on without our, um, our our loved ones or what we have lost, right? Fatigue and pain, absolutely. Easily angered, yes. Isolation, yeah. Thank you all for sharing because did you know that there are over 20 common symptoms of depression? Mm -hmm. So it's not just a kind of a typical, well, I'm feeling sad, right? Um, but there's a lot of things that you've all mentioned already um, but that you might see up here on the screen as well. And it can be that persistent, um, just feelings of sadness or emptiness, <clears throat> isolation, which y'all have mentioned as well, as well. difficulty thinking, um, lack of energy, lack of focus, concentration, mm -hmm. sleep changes um, or appetite changes that you might see, um, thoughts of death, or even something is, I don't want to go on, right? Those feelings of hopelessness or possibly even helplessness. I mean, you're just having more negative thoughts, just pessimism, um, when that would not be your normal case, um, or it's not how you normally thought um, before your loss. Feelings of worth, um, excuse me, guilt, worthlessness. A loss of the self-esteem um, is not listed up here, but just I don't have any self-esteem anymore. Having a hard time making decisions digestive problems, you name it. Um, these are all symptoms and signs of depression. With depression, um, it, it affects people in many different ways. And there's situational depression and there's depression that can come, of course, with, with the loss that we are experiencing and as we work through this grief work. But please know that this is not an exhaustive list of um, depressive symptoms and it does affect everybody in different ways. 
but let's talk about the treatment um, and therapy for depression because all depression can be treated. You know, it says here about 80 to 90% of depression can be cured, but another 20% can see a reduction in their symptoms. So we can reduce the symptoms and there's a lot of symptoms, right, here. Um, and then some that aren't listed, I can have a reduction in some of these symptoms um, or I can cure it all together. The earlier we start treatment, um, the more effective it's going to be. Of course, this is where it gets hard because when we're having um, depressive symptoms, it may be one of the last things we wanted to do is go do something that helps, you know, do some treatment or therapy for depression, right? But knowing the earlier we start, um, the more effective it will be. And no two people are going to be um, treated the same with depression because there's not a one size fits all treatment. And there's a variety of ways to treatment because there are medications that you can try working with the trusted doctor. And with the medications, there is a, um, a, a time of finding out what works best for you. And it can be a trial and error. Um, this medication may not work as, as well as we thought it would, or we wanna try a different dosage, or we wanna try a different one altogether because we just gotta, you know, doctor gotta figure out what's the best treatment plan for you. And then we want to incorporate other medication or excuse me, other treatments um, that um, help with the medication. And this might be talk therapy with a counselor. It might be support groups, um, but it might be alternative treatments like um, uh, nature therapy, music therapy, um, exercise, certain diets that can really help enhance the treatment of depression. But we do want to make sure that we're treating it and we're getting at it as soon as possible. So the graphic here, the saying goodbye, the, you know, which includes there's the, um, you know, the symptoms of grief and sometimes symptoms of depression and loss, but there can be pain, there can be sadness, there can be um, anger, anxiety, guilt, blaming, whether we're blaming others or ourselves. There's the numbness of this. And then there's that point of, you know, we're kind of making sense of what's going on. We're, um, we're processing through it. We're starting to learn, live with the loss, and how are we going to um, adjust to the loss that's here and still um, have it with our within our life experience. And that might be certain rituals we do, just a better understanding um, of ourselves and how we're working through this coping skills, memories we might have. And then moving forward to adjusting to a new a new life experience or a new normal or what, how does my life look like without um, the person or the thing that's in there anymore? There's some practicalities that's in there, you know, more socializing. socializing. But, you know, we look at this and you see all three of those circles still intertwine, you know, so it's not a um, black and white thing. It's not a clear cut. You've gone to this stage and now you're going to move on to this stage and you'll move on to this one and everything's going to be great. Um, you know, all these things intersect or they still um, uh, overlap with each other. And that can, that's a normal part of it. And that's to be expected with all of these things. You know, with the, um, the symptoms of grief and the bereavement and the mourning and the loss, if somebody has loss and they didn't have any of those feelings or those symptoms, then that's a time when we would want to be worried if they weren't having any of those. But all of these complicated feelings and emotions and dual emotions and thoughts and behaviors that we have, that's to be expected. And that is normal. So I'm going to give you a second just to kind of look over this graph, um, graphic, this whirlpool of grief. Just look at that for a moment and see um, if you, where you're at, potentially if you're grieving right now, or have you been there before, you know, with that river and then it hits that waterfall and see where all that water ends up and where it's, you know, whirlpooling around and swirling around. Mm -hmm. You know, as you take that initial, um, I guess, fall off the waterfall, there's the shock and numbness and denial, kind of that, you kind of take in that deep breath of, uh, and then you hit the waterfall of bereavement, right? It's the processing of it. And then you're down there in that whirlpool and it can look like there's this, the emotional um, disorganization or falling apart. And then you might kind of walk up over or wash up over here on the rocks where you see some physical symptoms and there are some pain that comes up. 
Um, or there's a times where you kind of wash up on the other, you get the other bank, right? And there's severe disorganization, feel broken down, um, I feel washed up. Mm -hmm. And then there's still that whirlpool, but maybe we get out of that whirlpool of grief, right? And now we're into um, more of a current moving out of that, but it's a, a mourning and acceptance the reality of absence. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really appreciate how they use those words together. There's a mourning of it and an acceptance. Mm -hmm. I'm accepting the reality of the absence, but I'm mourning it as well. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like? And then as we move down the river, um, there's some more reorganization and loving again. Please note that that never says that we've moved on from the loss or we have moved past the loss. It's there with us. It's just how we're framing it and which part um, of the whirlpool of grief are we in or which part of the, the stages we're in. But it says at the bottom, bereavement is what happens to you. Grief is what you feel and mourning is what you do. So there is a system. There's a process to going through all of this. Oh, let me go back. So. Um, and I'm going to say one thing, grief rarely happens when we expect it to. Um, you know, there are times when we expect grief. And again, we're going to talk about the different types of grief. But really, grief can hit us at any time. Or we might run off, run into a waterfall at any time. Mm -hmm. And it can be overwhelming. Um, it can be um, scary. It can make our knees buckle. We can continue to get hit by waves. And that's a normal part of grief. And I wanted to share that as well. So our basic needs um, for grief are, first, we want to know that there are people who can help. It might be um, loving, trusting people that you already have in your life, immediate family. It might be some um, community members that you already have, maybe a, um, a religious leader that you go to, that there are people that can help. There are trained people that can help as well. You are not the only one. Um, we all, this grief, loss, bereavement, mourning, all of this, this is a shared human experience that we all have. We all understand the feelings that I've talked about, what we're going to continue to talk about. We all know what those feelings are, how we've come to those feelings and, and what loss has brought us to those feelings are a little bit different, but we all understand um, what those feelings are. You know, the pain of grief becomes more manageable with time didn't say it goes away, right? It just becomes more manageable with time, um, particularly if we're working through it in a healthy way. And you can stay connected to your loved one um, and carry them into the future or to the loss um, or the thing, because you can carry that, whether it's a person or a thing or whatever your loss may be, um, we can carry them into the future with us. And there's a wide range of emotions, um, thoughts, experiences, behaviors um, that are considered very normal in grief. And your loss matters, and so does your grief. And you shouldn't let anybody else tell you otherwise with that. So I'm going to go through the, diff the 15 different types of grief. And I'm going to um, go through them, you know, fairly quickly, just with an interest of time. Um, but please, as we're walking through these, take note of some of these, and because um, you might see yourself in some of these, a lot of these, maybe one or two of these, um, or your clients or family members. But take note of what they are, um, and you know what can some common symptoms are. We'll talk about examples of them as well. But we'll start with abbreviated grief. I um, mean, this is grief that doesn't really last as long as it's expected to, or it was a short response to a loss. And it can be common after there's an extended illness of somebody, um, or there was an insignificant attachment to the person or thing. You know, the example down here, there's a loss of a distant relative that I didn't see um, very much or really have that close of a relationship to is a good example of them. Uh, it can manifest, um, the grief can manifest and it can double um, in the future if it's not fully resolved right now. It may fill the void um, or somebody may fill the void too soon to keep from grieving. For example, they may remarry um, very soon after the loss of a spouse um, or get pregnant again after a miscarriage because I want to fill that void with something. It is common with anticipatory grief. Um, 
in which we'll talk about. And it's common in children too. Children um, just seem to kind of move through grief a little bit quicker than adults do. Um, but it also might be that, you know, we don't like the feelings of grief. You know, they're uncomfortable and they're painful and they hurt. Um, so I don't want to feel what I'm feeling right now. So I might try to interrupt that um, through, and I might use um, uh, drugs, I might use alcohol, I might use work to do that, anything so I can um, either distract myself or take that pain away. Um, and of course, um, this can lead to worse problems like depression, um, anxiety, possibly addiction as well. And you can see some common symptoms here that include sleep disruptions, um, body aches, depression, trouble concentrating, etc. Absent grief. This is when somebody really shows no signs of grief um, and appears to really be unaffected by their loss. There's denial, there's avoidance, there's numbness. Um, it can tend to happen or it is more common. It's seen more common in people that have a sudden loss. It is a form of complicated grief, which uh, we will talk about, but it typically manifests as a physical symptom. Um, or, or potentially an emotional symptom at some point if it's not dealt with. So, you know, there's no signs of grieving, um, but there might be some physical pain that they um, are complaining about. Mm -hmm. There might be there might be more irritability, um, or they they're forgetting about the loss, or they just they just don't feel connected to the loss anymore. You know, an example is parents who put aside their grief to help their child um, through a loss somebody that refuses to talk about a loss or refuse to acknowledge um, a loss that's happened. <clears throat> it can be, um, or, or it can be manifest in the way what we just talked about um, with feeling, um, feeling my time with something else because I don't want to feel those feelings. So I want to be distracted or I, I don't want to do this right now. So I'm going to involve myself in more work or I'm going to numb my feelings with drugs or alcohol or food or something like that. But it does say down there at the bottom, it's just because someone doesn't appear to be grieving doesn't mean that they're not grieving. Mm -hmm. It could be that they're showing their grief in just very subtle ways um, and they're having more uh, internal turmoil as well. So there is ambiguous grief. Um, and this one is very common for somebody with dementia um, or caring for somebody with dementia because, or somebody with a chronic illness because it's grieving the loss of the living, you know? Um, in it, the picture up here, there's, there's nothing more difficult than grieving a loss of a loved one who is still alive and who I can see and whom I interact with every day, right? Um, but it's mourning without closure, um, which can lead us to, disorient, to be disoriented, um, not really understanding how to move forward or not understanding the loss. Um, and can be left with a lot of unanswered questions. Um, and as the relationship changes, or this changes the relationship. Without that physical kind of normal, what we expect um, type of uh, grief, um, it can be, we can be consumed about thinking um, that life might not return to normal or that life will return to normal, right? And we can't really have closure um, when we have these situations. There can be shame, there can be embarrassment over the loss. Um, and many times this pain isn't acknowledged publicly, but, but we also don't wanna receive help um, or support, or we don't reach out for help or support and, court and encouragement for others. Cause we also might, not, people may not understand this type of grief, right? It, because it feels very um, personal. We may blame ourselves um, with some of this grief because particularly with somebody with dementia, we feel um, like, we may not be able to take care of them as well as we thought we could have, particularly if there are some behavioral expressions involved. Um, but these reactions, this ambiguous grief, and all of these grief types we're talking about, they're very normal reactions to sometimes abnormal situations. Mm -hmm. Examples, of course, are um, there might be kidnappings, missing um, uh, war, mis uh, missing in action, natural disasters, dementia, the foster care system, uh, mental health issues, divorce, suicides, all of those things. 
So there's ambiguous grief and there's anticipatory grief. It's also very common in people that have are caring for somebody with dementia or chronic illnesses. And this is an, an we're anticipating a loss in the future. So we're grieving um, a loss before it happens. And this can be a loss of a person. It can be the decline um, of a person, but it could also be what we thought life would be like. So I am grieving the loss of my future. I'm grieving the loss of some hopes or dreams that I had because of my situation right now. But this is a process of letting go, of letting go. And it can have a lot of closure that happens before the actual um, like death loss happens. Um, it's common in those, like I said, with terminal illnesses. And people are hesitant to express um, the deep pain of loss they feel before a death. Um, and, and a lot of that just can be because it is, um, again, we feel like it's an abnormal feeling, um, but it is a very normal feeling in an abnormal situation. Um, but we may not um, open up to people that may not understand what this feeling is. But some symptoms can be, of course, um, anger, losses, um, loss of emotional control, depression, resentment, guilt, anxiety, uh, memory problems, heightened concern about things because I'm anticipating something, you know, happening, whether it's a death or I'm anticipating a decline in my loved one. Excuse me. Um, the benefits of this, however, can be there's a chance um, for important conversations to happen. Um, there can be a, a chance for healing work between relationships that can happen, forgiveness, um, making plans, leaving a legacy, um, sharing, uh, uh, you know, stories and spending that quality time together. You know, this can be um, also related to anticipated layoffs, um, possibly a pending divorce. Um, it could also relate to people that are um, entering the empty nest part of their lives. We're anticipating the children moving out of the home and not being around as much. Mm -hmm. The reality of dementia um, and looking at both ambiguous and anticipatory grief, um, but the reality of this is that our loved one, um, you know, they are still, they are both here, um, but they're gone as well. So there's that duality that's happening. Um, there's also I can take a, I can take care of my loved one, um, and I can take care of myself. I am both a caregiver, but I am also a person that need, um, needs my own needs or um, has my own needs. And I both wish, or I, yeah, I both wish it was over, um, but also wish that my loved one kept things kept keeps on living. Mm -hmm. And I'm both sad about lost hopes, dreams, futures. But I also might be happy or excited about some new hopes and dreams. And this is that reality, you know, there's that that anticipation of the loss. But there's also an anticipation of what can be. For a patient, um, the anticipatory grief is also very real. Um, as a person, you know, particularly somebody that's terminally ill, um, they're going through their dying experience. Um, they're working through this. They're working through the anticipatory grief, potential um, type of separation anxiety, because they're losing all their relationships, um, abilities, roles, things, kind of all at the same time or, you know, um, in succession with their disease state, rather than just one, um, you know, like a caregiver might be receiving it. And it can be overwhelming um, in, in allowing them, that patient, the time to go through their grief work that they need to go to, um, but also knowing that they may withdraw, they may withdraw socially, they may withdraw inward. Um, you know, an example is they may face the wall um, when you're in the room with them or you come and visit and they may turn the other way because um, they're trying to cope with the impact and the effect that the loss losses are having on them. But again, it's also a good time um, to say goodbye or to have allow for that meaningful conversations and meeting um, and having that closure. You know, you know, as a grandmother, you might tell a grandchild, we're going to miss each other, right? Um, but we've had great experiences together and great memories and, and let's talk about those. 
collective grief. Um, this is a type of grief that is experienced by a group of people. Um, feelings of not being in control, feelings of being powerless. You know, the examples are um, assassination of JFK, 9-11, um, any natural disaster like, um, you know, the, the hurricanes, Katrina or Harvey. Um, of course, the pandemic that we all just recently went through, the Challenger disaster, the death of Princess Diana or John Lennon. Um, these are collective grief experiences. Um, a benefits is that we are linked and we're connected with the mourning of others. So we're, um, we've experienced a lot at the same time. Um, we're mourning through it. We might have those acts um, that we're showing our sadness and our grief is uh, that we can come together and do that. As you can see the uh, picture here, their vigil set up or set up. Um, right now, there's unprecedented um, times because of the loss of COVID, um, but there's also been racial tensions. There's job loss, there's graduations, there's weddings, there's isolations from support systems. You know, there's all these losses that go on, but then also those every kind of day things, right, that also happen. What can help is public mourning um, because we're having a collective grief. It's um, very helpful to have some collective healing as well as a community, um, whether we we do it and we um, go to, um, you know, public uh, funerals or remembrances like is in the picture, or we might just go and volunteer for an organization that's helping the community better. Um, and it's giving yourself time to grieve with the group, but also giving yourself time to grieve privately as well. So complicated grief, chronic grief, exaggerated grief, prolonged grief, um, these are kind of all clumped together. Um, and complicated grief, as you have kind of pointed out a few times, does encompass um, a lot of griefs. But this type of grief uh, is when a prolonged grief interferes with the day-to-day -day life and ability to function. So this grief has overtaken. It's been prolonged for a significant amount of time, and it really is functioning or prolonged ability for somebody to function day to day. Now, an immediate grief is sudden, you know, it's hard for somebody to function day to day for a short period of time, but then we kind of start to, um, the fog kind of starts to clear out. And we're not going back to what we were doing, um, but we can kind of put one foot in front of the other, you know, a little bit. But this is a little bit different where it's prolonged. They're not able to function um, day to day. And it's these intense reactions um, of the sorrow and the pain, inability to think about anything else, talk about anything else. Um, you know, there's extreme loss, uh, excuse me, extreme longing for the loss. There can be numbness, detachment, um, self-isolation. Um, and, and these feelings don't get better over time. They get worse over time um, or, or they don't. They just kind of maintain where they're at. Um, and this can be um, more complicated. We have conflicting feelings about a loss of an abusive parent or abusive partner. Mm -hmm. Some symptoms can look like rage, avoidance, self-destructive behavior, um, suicidal thoughts, um, irrational fears as well. Um, you know, so it's, we're not showing any improvement over a period of time. And um, the feelings do not come and go or lessen with intensity. They are intense all the time. So an example would be a parent grieving the loss of a child, um, tragic accidents, loss to suicide, loss to suicide, um, dependent relationships, and then even um, multiple losses occurring close together, which we'll talk about some of that grief as well too. Um, with these types of grief, this is where we do want to seek out professional help because we would need somebody, a trained person to help um, an individual identify coping skills, um, work through different types of grief um, that they might be dealing with, and find with coping skills that works best for them. And a professional would help them get through get through that or, um, or work through that grief work. Of course, we have conventional grief or what we typically hear of um, more often. And this is um, it's a normal, natural response to any type of loss. It is very individualistic, it's very unique, um, but it's common. It's a common to experience changes um, and have these, the, these feelings and physical behaviors and manifestations um, over a loss. And in time, these symptoms will lessen and somebody will um, start to be able to function normally again. The feelings will come and go while uh, there might be periods of intense 
feelings of grief and loss, um, but the feelings do come and go. And there's a there's a, um, a kind of a movement towards acceptance um, and loss, <clears throat> a, a gradual lessening of the grief symptoms that we can have. And the examples of a death of somebody that you love, a loss of a job, a marriage, loss of a marriage, um, a loss of a home. So cumulative grief or grief overload, um, this is a loss or losses that occur within a short amount of time of each other. So where somebody's experiencing multiple losses at once, and this can be really any two losses um, or more that are close together. So it could be, you know, a loss of a job and then a divorce um, or a, a, you know, divorce and then a loss of a pet. Um, it can be an, an empty nest followed by a death, right? <clears throat> so any um, losses, two or more losses that are right, um, re really co concurrent or right next to each other. Or we might see it where there's a current lot current loss dredges up feelings um, of loss we've suffered in the past, particularly if we didn't work through those um, those losses in the past very well. This can lead to PTSD, um, substance abuse um, disorder, major depressive disorder. Um, and then and examples of this is an accident where several family members um, might are lost all at once, an unexpected death of a friend followed by a death of a family member. Um, of course, the losses during the pandemic, we saw a lot of those because it even, it might've been a family member, but um, friends of families, you know, we knew of a lot of people that had a lot of losses, mm -hmm. um, multiple pets within a short amount of time. So delayed grief, this is a, um, a period of time, there's a significant period of time um, when there's the loss and the reaction to it. So I've had the loss that this, I didn't have a reaction to it until much later. Um, it can be caused because the person is trying to be strong, trying to be there for other people, take care of business, um, get things done. It can also be due just to shock um, and denial. This is a form of complicated grief. Um, and the grieving may not happen until um, a significant time where the loss occurs and it can result in overwhelming response, opening the floodgate from the initial loss. So if I have a loss and there's a delayed grief there, when that grief comes, it can be well doubled. Mm -hmm. So this is where that, um, you know, kind of hits, it hits from the blue, but it's overwhelming response and not really sure how to, how to manage it. Um, examples, it could be a widowed parent, um, an, adult, an adult child, left to care for a surviving parent as well. Um, it can be grief after a murder, after a natural disaster, you know, as we're working through these. Disenfranchised grief, um, this is when um, the loss is being mourned, like, a per, you know, a, per, a loss to you um, is not really acknowledged by others. And this could be a perceived loss, but it could um, just be society may not consider it, or the community, or even a family unit may not consider it to, to be a major loss, but maybe a minor loss. Um, it can be due to stigma. It can be due to a um, hundred things, not expressing our feelings or expressing our relationship and how that loss really did affect us. Um, but it can lead to being deprived of our right to grieve. Um, or in going through the, the rituals we need to go through, going through that mourning and the bereavement. And this can look like it's an, a loss of an ex-spouse, um, a co-worker, um, a celebrity or a role model that you've had, um, a failed adoption, miscarriages, abortions, um, chronic illness, because it might even be a loss of a mobility or an ability that you did have, you may not have anymore. Mm -hmm. um, or you may feel disenfranchised when you see family members um, uh, going through grief faster than you are, um, or saying things that you need to get over it, or um, shouldn't you be over this by now? Um, and that can cause some disenfranchised grief as well. Disordered grief is an extreme emotional reaction um, or behavior, usually following the loss. Um, and usually the loss is tragic um, or there's unforeseen circumstances. This can look like somebody might not be able to cry despite um, the profound loss, um, or they become really obsessed with the loss and go to, um, to extreme measures. You know, it could be that they um, 
there's a lawsuit that they put out here. You know, an example is the death is caused by a medical error. Um, so there's a lawsuit that they go out because somebody has to pay, right? Um, it can also look into that there's um, phobias that um, will um, present related to the loss. They're like they're not able to enter the building that they where the loss occurred. I use something like that. I mean, physically not able to enter the building to do that. Um, it is a form of complicated grief. Um, and they may develop some identity issues. If a person died from cancer, um, you know, and that's a loss, they may decide they have that same type of cancer as well. So, so there's some um, distorted thought patterns that can present with this distorted grief. There's inhibited grief, and this um, shows up the physical signs and symptoms. So the grief is a pain. It's an ache. It's a headache. It's a stomach ache um, because somebody is trying to emotionally keep their or keep their emotions hidden, um, either consciously or subconsciously. Um, they're trying to do that, but the grief is going to come out, and usually it looks like a physical pain. And it may continue for a long, long time, um, but this physical manifestation is happening. And generally what happens is they'll start to self-medicate um, to help with the pain, the physical pain that they're feeling, but also to avoid those emotions that are eventually going to bubble up. Um, so they could be grieving a loss of a suicide, um, mourning an affair, right? Um, trying to stay strong for others, but not trying to fall apart, or really just having a hard time accepting, accepting reality and accepting the loss um, and, um, and, and part of their life. Masked grief, um, unable to recognize the symptoms and behaviors um, as reactions to loss. So they, are, they mask them as physical symptoms or their maladaptive behaviors. So the, here it's the griever has become so adept at suppressing their feelings of emotional pain that they take on other symptomology. This is a form of complicated grief. Um, and it might be from a parent who develops an illness after the death of a child. Um, or a sibling showing symptoms of the cause of the death of their brother or sister. So they're masking it with something else. And there's secondary loss. Um, and these are smaller losses that are associated with a larger loss or a more traumatic loss. Um, and these are unexpected ways that we um, suffer um, due to loss. And sometimes they show up a little bit later on, or they might show up fairly suddenly. Um, but, you know, you can see here on the graphic, you know, there's, we'll say the first loss is death, the death of a loved one, and then some secondary losses that might come into that. There's a loss of income, right? Um, it can be a loss of an identity or a role that you play that you no longer have anymore. We've talked about loss of hope and dreams, loss of relationships, of faith, financial security, uh, maybe it's a support system. Um, property, health, and just security overall. Those secondary losses that might we might notice at first, but they also might just show up a little bit later. Uh, so it can be the loss of a companion um, that we've had. It could be even a gardener or a banker, right, or a cook, or those those roles that that person played in our lives. Mm -hmm. And then losses like not eating out alone, as opposed to eating with my companion or my spouse or whomever. I'm shopping for one now or I'm making meals for one, I'm eating mail for one and taking on those maybe potentially added responsibilities like now I am um, managing the finances or the yard or all of the home care, maintaining that home. Traumatic grief um, is a sudden and unexpected loss. Um, more likely this will lead to um, complicated grief, particularly if it's not worked through identified first um, or worked through um, uh, well, but there's that shock and unexpected loss. Um, it can trigger an intrusive body response that are distorted survival mechanisms. So PTSD um, can absolutely, um, is much related to this type of loss. The symptoms can be more intense. They can be more persistent, more per pervasive um, than other types of grief. And they can stay, you know, for longer periods of time. And, you know, examples of this um, are loss of a child. There's violent deaths, whether there was murder um, or 9-11, of course. And we can see it manifest as nightmares or there's flashbacks that they're having. Um, maybe some phobias, like they can't go into that, um, you know, building where the loss happened, right? And um, there's um, unfinished business that they need to have. There's 
of course, anger, denial, anxiety, um, to where they're not able to really function very well. Uninhibited grief, so we inhibited, this is uninhibited grief, where they're showing no reaction, no reaction to the loss. Um, the grief is being held back or restrained. There's no outward signs of grieving. And it will generally show up as something physical, um, like stomach problems, sleeping problems, body aches. Mm -hmm. And it's really a way to remain in control of an uncontrollable situation. Mm -hmm. Or they, um, their behavior change to where they stay very busy so they don't have to feel those emotions. Mm -hmm. Um, the graphic, you know, we, when we are traumatized, um, we are blind. When we have resolved our traumas, we can see. So I like that as part as we kind of wrap up these different types of grief. Um, it's working through, it's working through these griefs, identifying what they are, identifying some of the symptoms, some of the causes of what, what might happen with them. Um, but how do I work through this, right? As healthcare professionals, for those of you on the call um, and greet healthcare professionals, and I would say first responders, I would say um, spiritual leaders, religious leaders as well, we're trained to put aside our own feelings and emotions to tend with the families or a resident um, uh, or the community right then, particularly during a crisis, uh, or a crisis um, that self-care, that need for self-care is foreign because we got to take care of this crisis right now. Um, and depending on how long that crisis grows, you know, I would say there's um, short-term crises and then there's longer term, like the pandemic has been several years. Um, and how have how professionals or leaders in the community put aside their own feelings and emotions to help tend to the community or families or residents? And how is that manifested in types of grief, right? Um, but dealing with personal thoughts and emotions that arise um, during these times um, is important to understand, to provide um, ongoing care um, and ethical care of families, the residents, and community, but also having that personal awareness to say, you know, self-care is important, so I can continue to provide um, the care that I need to, that I've got to be able to cope um, with the loss that I'm having, um, particularly if it's in a and in a work setting, whether it's a community, a long-term care community, a hospital, a firehouse, you name it. How do I work with that? Um, because healthcare professionals have relationships with these people that um, are, are being uh, lost, right? So an, an easy way to do that is to take breaks, recognize your feelings, understand them, um, be prepared, have peer support for that. Um, and in, in these settings, Supporting each other, um, leaving supportive notes for a colleague, um, not being afraid to say, you know what, I really miss Mrs. Jones. Um, I miss having her around. Me and her were like this, and I miss that. Um, and or or saying a little um, prayer, having some affirmations with others, and just acknowledging um, acknowledging some of this, encouraging each other. I like this bullet point where it says, at the end of a shift or at the end of a day, um, think of three things that you did well. Mm -hmm. What went well? Um, what did I do well? What did I do well emotionally, physically, mentally, um, whether for myself or was to help somebody else? That can really help me work through some of these grief um, symptoms and grief responses. So families, um, what do family caregivers want when they are grieving? And what do they really need, right? So as healthcare professionals, but also family members, caring for other family members, uh, we need to honor our loved one's wishes. We need to know what they are, so maybe we need to ask what those wishes are, and we need to honor those and be respectful of them. Families need to be included in the decision-making. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead to this honesty and transparency, um, really in education with this. You know, if I'm a healthcare professional, I have a different set of knowledge um, and words, you know, lingo that we use that a family or the outside community may not know. So it might be just starting at a level of, well, what do you understand about your loved one's illness or about the situation right now? Um, and hearing back from the family so, so you have an understanding of what the family understands so y'all can be on the same page and being honest with what the situation is what the illness is, what the treatment plan is, or what the outcomes of the treatment can be or cannot be, um, but being honest in a respectful way and being transparent. 
uh, families need support from the whole team. Um, they, from the person in the parking lot all the way to the doctor that they're talking to, to the, um, to the people at the front desk, to people in the hallway, they need support from everybody. And I would kind of say, um, professionals, you need support from the whole team as well. So make sure you're supportive of the whole team. Um, to be remembered, um, to be remembered and to be talked about outside of the medical terms of things, whether it's in the hospital or a community or whatever it is, let's, who is this person outside of the illness or outside of this emergency? Mm -hmm. Let's, let's remember them. Let's learn about them in those ways. And the families need to know that they did everything that they could mm -hmm. and they did everything right, um, or they did everything well, I should say. Um, and they, they're there for their loved one. And what they're doing is loving their loved one. So we want to be able to provide resources for the families as well. And this is connecting them with support groups. Um, there are a variety of support groups here in the DFW area, uh, but I know they're all over the place. There's online support groups now. Um, there's social workers, there's chaplains, there's counselors, um, there's bibliotherapy. And this is um, healing with books. So it might be that you have certain books that you would recommend or, um, you know, uh, groups, uh, books that uh, like brief support groups have used in the past that you might be able to say this group or this book may help you through this or this pamphlet or reading these stories of these experiences of people that have gone through this in the past. Um, reading their experiences can be very helpful for a lot of people as they're internally processing their grief, uh, their grief symptoms in their mourning and bereavement. And of course, hospice is a wonderful place to get support. Um, this is for the whole family, not just a patient or someone diagnosed, but it's the whole family support. Um, and they um, will help the whole family. And it doesn't have to be that immediate caregiver or anything, uh, but it's everybody in the family that comes and visits as well. So grief affecting the body. So what does grief look like um, for us as a person. Um, and, and take note of some of these things because you might see these in yourself as you look past, um, you know, in your past losses, you know, like, gosh, when I lost, um, you know, my job or I lost my marriage, I did start to feel those ways. And that's just how it manifested in my body. Was it digestive issues? Did you have um, um, sleep disturbances? Were you overindulgent in food or alcohol or drugs or shopping? Um, was there um, uh, more sensitivity to, to, to the sun or did you have increases in inflammation? Did your blood pressure take go through the roof? You know, just thinking about some of these things, um, that activated nervous system is, a, um, is our fight or flight response. So did you feel yourself you were either in fight mode or flight mode all of the time? When the stress of grief um, is chronic, we react physically um, and it can contribute to other medical conditions. So remember, grief comes um, in emotional waves um, or they oscillate back and forth. So it's normal and expected to have a surge of grief symptoms. Um, and I will say grief and stress go hand in hand, okay? So it's normal to have a surge of this or, or a wave of these grief symptoms and then it kind of goes back and then there can be another wave. Now, as time goes on, those waves don't hit as often, but they're still gonna hit. And that is, um, that is expected, that is normal. We would be worried if that did not happen to you or if these waves did not come. So how grief affects the brain, you can see here, um, the thinking center of our brain is underactive. So that's where some of that brain fog comes in, right? Or I'm just uh, really not able to focus, can't really think of anything, can't make decisions, uh, plan, right? But what also happens is our um, emotional regulation center, um, the, the regulation of the emotions becomes underactive, but the fear center becomes overactive. Mm -hmm. So we have perceived threats, um, you know, and this is where that fight or flight response comes up. And the brain knows um, how to heal itself, just like the body knows how to heal itself, but it takes time and it takes um, therapy, right? If I had a wound on my knee, I would first need to identify it, um, but I would need to start doing the right proper treatment to make sure it heals well. And the body does its own thing. It's the same for the brain. I need to identify it, but then I need to start implementing that proper treatment so it heals well. 
but you know, just like a wound on my knee doesn't heal overnight, um, neither will a brain, it will take time. So it's okay to not be okay. And this is how to cope with grief. And I love that. I love that saying, it's okay to not be okay. And the other one um, is you're having a normal response to an abnormal situation. Mm -hmm. so, so some things to take in note in counseling. Um, this is you, they name it to tame it. If I can name that feeling or if I can name what I see, I can tame it. Because mm -hmm. I got control over it once it's got a name, right? I can sink my teeth into it and really kind of work on it and start to tame it. Support groups are great um, because not only are you, you have the facilitator, there's resources that um, are, you know, your fingertips, because you're also with people that are going through the same thing as you. And that is therapy within itself, just being able to talk to people that understand, know that it's going to take time and you'll need a support system put in place. Um, you have all these things here, but we were taught, um, or most generally we're not taught um, emotional hygiene. We have physical hygiene um, that we're taught, but emotional hygiene really aren't taught how to do it. There's not really a lot of formal training on how to deal with it, right, or how to deal with loss. Um, and really we get our emotional hygiene from what we've seen, um, our close people in our lives, how they deal with loss and grief. So if you think back, you know, how did you deal with loss? Was it based on um, your guardians and how you saw them, your parents, the people that were around you, how they dealt with um, grief or loss? And generally, that's what we fall back to, what we've learned on how to grieve and loss. But it's, um, we got to learn better ways sometimes. we got to learn new ways, um, particularly as we have different types of loss. Um, and know that we got to give ourselves permission to grieve and go through this process. And another thing I say is our bodies are um, designed to process things, not to store things. So if we think about it, when we have too much fat, there's negative consequences. You know, when we have too much alcohol, there are negative consequences. Uh, when we have too many emotion, too many emotional experiences, excuse me, we have negative consequences. So we got to memorialize our loss. Um, go to a place that was important to them. Um, do something, a tradition that uh, kind of memorializes that loss for you. And it might be, um, I know for us in the loss of my mother, we go to her gravesite. Um, you know, fairly often. It's not as much as we used to, but we go and we um, we go as kind of an intimate family. We talk. You know, sometimes we don't, you know, we'll say a, um, a short prayer, but sometimes we might just kind of catch up with each other right there. And that's a tradition that we have done. And we do it on certain days, certain anniversaries that we do. Um, and that's been a kind of a memorialization. So we're still having life and we've brought mom into the future with us by doing that. And that's something that's just that our family has done. Um, but it's a part of this memorialization and working through the grief. And it's, you know, it's okay to not be okay. And some of those days um, are easier than others, right? Some of those rituals and anniversaries are either easier than others, even, you know, 12 years later. So grieving is moving forward through feelings. It takes time to adapt to all the changes. Um, and it takes time to adapt to the losses. So there are two types of pain in this world. Pain that simply hurts you and pain that inspires you to grow. And so we can think of grief while it is hard work. Um, it is, um, it's growth work as well. So there is no timeline. How do you move forward? Um, acknowledge the grief. The only way to move forward is to feel the hard feelings, um, to do the pain, to do the anger, to do the guilt, to do the crying, to feel those hard feelings. Um, and replace the need to understand with a commitment to move forward, because there will come times where you may not understand why, um, or there's going to be some unanswered, unanswered questions. And if I can replace that, I need to understand why, whether it's, whether it's why me, or why her, or why this, or um, why now, um, or it could just be, you know what, I'm going to make this commitment to move forward and accept the loss for what it is. How do I incorporate this into my new life experience? Um, you can do this, you know, tears um, and grieving in public, give permission for others to express their grief and it humanizes um, tragedies, it humanizes loss. But of course we wanna be aware that there are um, um, appropriate times to grieve in public 
Um, and it's also depending on cultures as well um, when, it's, when it's appropriate to do that. So some more ways to move forward. Um, find ways to stay connected to the deceased um, by taking time to remember them, remembering who they are, their accomplishments, um, what they meant to you, and finding pleasurable activities for yourself. Um, and make a point to engage in those, and they might be past hobbies that you've always done, or it might be a new hobby that you want to do, um, but you got to be intentional about engaging in those. And particularly, it might be at first, you got to fake it until you make it. Um, or it might be, you know what, I really don't enjoy this activity, so try something else, all right? Um, but fake it until you make it, because it's going to help us move forward. Um, in practicing just good lifestyle choices that we all know, eating well, exercising, um, staying connected with trusted people, right? Um, trusted friends and family. It might be that you write about your experience. Nobody ever has to read it. Um, you just can write about it if you want to, whether it's journaling it or you write it on a piece of paper or type it up and you either delete it if you don't want somebody to see it or you're done with it, or you can um, uh, crumble it up and throw it away or burn it in a safe way. Um, some people have done that. But also accepting help um, or asking for support to help us through this. Focus on future goals positive future goals, right? And acknowledge those um, that are either within your immediate community or those in the outer, or the larger community who really do want to help and the resources that are available to you. There are a lot of resources and I'm gonna leave you with some resources at the end of the slideshow um, to help us work through some of this grief loss or to share with family members or to share with clients. But establish a climate of healing and promote the value of working through the hard work um, because this is healing work. It also um, provides alternatives to blaming or um, to going down some distorted thought patterns because it uh, acknowledges the feelings of anger. It acknowledges those feelings of, um, of guilt, maybe, or even shame, but it redirects that energy on providing support, providing um, problem solving, and being able to move forward instead of just, because those are, can be negative feelings, right? We don't want to go down that negative road, but we acknowledge these feelings, they're there, they're normal, and how do we provide support and help use those feelings to move forward to growth and healing. So some ways to distract yourself at home, um, you know, any of these, start a journal, cook, bake, learn to cook or bake, do a puzzle, um, listen to music, take up photography, Go snuggle with an animal or, you know, heat a blanket. <laughs> you want to do text an old friend that maybe you haven't talked to in a while or call them up even better on the phone. Um, write a, write a uh, letter, play a game, you name it. Um, watch a movie, make a to-do list. These are things when uh, maybe a wave of grief has come at you and you work through it or it's kind of, you know, you want to move on to the next, um, helping me move forward, right? What can I do to help do that? So the next couple of slides, um, we'll look through the grief cycles, and this one um, might look familiar to you all because this is the one that we're most familiar with um, and, and that, that are taught generally. But these are the five uh, stages of grief, right? And these are the Kubler-Ross things, and there's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Under denial, you can see you have those thoughts and emotions that come with that. It can be fear, it can be shock. And then there might be anger where there's anxiety or irritation, frustration into that bargaining where I do feeling, I'm feeling um, overwhelmed or I just, I just want to get away from it all, right? I want to leave. I want something to change. Um, and then into depression where I'm, I'm having a hard time finding meaning. I'm reaching out to others, um, but I'm telling a story and then it helps us move on into acceptance to where I'm exploring new options um, and or I'm planning um, a, a, planning the new life with living with that loss. I've incorporated the loss into the new life, right? So we have this kind of clean uh, stages of grief. And, and we all know with this, you go back and forth. It is not a step by, you know, it's not a step by step thing. You go back and forth. Sometimes you can feel all of these in one day, or it can be, you know, I'm in denial. I was in bargaining and now I'm back to denial. It's not, um, um, in a step-by-step -step manner, um, and we can go back and forth with these. But you see this one and that one, 
this might look more appropriate to you, right? It's the, still the same five stages of grief. You got your denial, the anger, the bargaining, depression, and acceptance. But you can see it goes all the way around, um, and it's back and forth, and it's a, it's kind of a jumbled mess, right? Um, but this is sometimes what grief really feels like um, as we're working through it. And there's no timeline, or there's no, you know, in three months, you should be at this point. Um, but it is just, it's what it is. It's how it feels. Mm -hmm. And then there's a grief cycle. Um, so you can see here, it's six um, stages here. And there's this shock and denial, number one. So there's that, um, there can be some denial, avoidance, fear in there. And then number two is anger, the frustration, the anxiety, um, irritation. And then we're moving and cycling into number three um, with the depression and the detachment. And then you can see four um, is that bargaining part um, where, you know, I'm reaching out. I'm struggling to find meaning to this. And then number five is acceptance to where there's, I've got a new plan um, that I'm starting to, or I'm exploring new options at least. And then number six, returning to a meaningful life. Um, this is where I'm taking my loss and I'm attaching some meaning to it. Um, so I'm taking this, this loss, this situation, this death, this journey, this caregiving, this dementia, and I'm going to attach some meaning to what I've gone through. Mm -hmm. A great example is I, um, we have a family member, um, caregiver, who has written a book about her experiences as a caregiver for dementia. Um, and her being able to write that book is giving other caregivers, I mean, it's giving her meaning, um, and she's attached meaning to her experiences, um, but it's also giving um, uh, support and education and knowledge and validation to many other family caregivers that get to read her beautiful book. And then we have this dual process mode um, of coping and bereavement. So it looks like, you know, everyday life experience and you have this loss oriented bubble and this restoration oriented bubble. So the loss oriented, you've got grief work, you've got this intrusion of grief, um, we're breaking bonds or ties, and we have this denial and avoidance. And then we have this restoration oriented where we're attending to life's challenges. We're doing new things. We can we can be distracted from grief for a time, uh, but there's, you know, there's some avoidance of grief of that. And we're looking at new identities or new roles or new relationships. But you can see right there in the middle is that line goes back and forth to them all day long. Right. As we are working through this, I might be going back and forth or ping ponging back and forth um, from a loss oriented to a restoration oriented throughout the day. And that's just a dual process. And it's, it's a form of coping with bereavement as we go through this. And, and we show you all of these because these are normal. Um, it may feel like at times that we're going insane, but this is normal. These are normal things to do. Um, we just got to be able to work through them and feel these feelings um, and accept these experiences. When to seek professional help, because while there are um, ways to healthily work through um, uh, grief, there are times and there are resources and there are groups that can really help us to get through this. Um, grief Share is one of them. There are a lot of grief support groups in the community. The James L. West Center offers a grief support group that meets every month. There's so many resources out there. But I wanna say remembering that thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and reactions are normal. So all the ones we've talked about or didn't even talk about, um, these are normal reactions. However, if you find yourself um, focusing on them a lot, you might want to seek additional support. And it doesn't have to be a counselor or a psychologist. Well, there are great people to help seek support out. It's just somebody or a group that's trained and they can help us identify coping skills that you may not have known you had. Um, or realize some coping skills that you're using right now that might not be so helpful and how can we move, kind of replace coping skills, right? So um, most people experience a gradual lessening of grief intensity as they adapt to the loss, but it takes time um, and it's painful, but it's a gradual lessening of the of intensity of grief um, as we adapt to the loss that we have. But if you see um, or feel in yourself or a loved one or a client, there's some catastrophizing, believing that, that um, the worst is yet to happen um, or it's just coming down the pipeline. They're ruminating. They're going over and over uh, a thought and they're not completing it. They're not rationalizing it or moving on to something else. They're just stuck there. 
the if only thoughts, um, thinking too much about what could have been different or what I should have done, right? Um, avoiding um, any reminders of the of the deceased or of the loss, um, whether it's uh, you know a thing or or a role. They don't talk about it. They don't let anybody else talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, there's disruption in their behaviors, whether it's sleeping, eating, um, drinking more often, you know anything like that. Social contact, self isolation, self isolation, um, chronic physical pain that they're experiencing. Um, or spending excessive time with mementos of deceased. You know, they won't let them go or they won't, um, you know, example, they're at the grave site every day, all day, and they, that hasn't lessened over time. Um, but feeling unable to experience any positive emotions, these are times where we might want to seek professional help and people that are properly trained to help us work through this in a positive way. So, and how do we support others that are dealing with grief and as being present? Um, I think just going through this and identifying what the symptoms are and that it is can be all over the place. It can be intense at times. It can be very hard. Uh, but if you're willing just to sit with somebody um, that and be present with them, then that's the best way to do it. Ask them what they need for support. Mm -hmm. Um, find resources. Um, take care of yourself if you're supporting somebody else because it can be emotionally hard to help support somebody else through grief. So make sure that you're taking care of yourself. And small gestures. It could be a, um, a text that I'm thinking about you, a, a card, um, help with laundry, deliver a meal, make them, invite them over for dinner one night, um, anything like that, and just letting them talk. Um, listen, but don't advise and don't judge. And talking about grief can be very difficult and exhausting. Supporting somebody um, and listening to them can be hard as well. But we can help really ease the pain just by acknowledging it in ourselves um, and acknowledging it in others. Grief is something we'll all go through. Um, we'll all go through it in our own way and in our own time. And don't underestimate how you'll be affected. Um, give yourself permission to grieve and to grieve at your pace. And... You'll never forget the sacred time you spend with somebody um, as they transition from one life to the next. So if somebody, if you were with somebody that is actively passing, um, it, is a, it is sacred and it is a journey to go on if you choose to, to do that. Here are the resources. Um, I uh, mentioned earlier these great websites that you can go to to help you with um, this grief journey, um, understanding what it is, um, and uh, uh, good skills um, to put into place, coping skills that you can um, start practicing now. And we want to become better, not bitter. And this is some of our information here. Um, and I, there's just a, a few minutes left. There are two minutes left. Um, if there are any questions or Marty, oh, I'm going to show you, um, can, talk can, about the next page. Can, yeah, can you go back to the slides? Real quick? I want to do, go over, want you to go over the CEUs real quick before we start losing people. And then we're gonna talk about the next if we can. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Do you wanna go through the, go over there? Do you, uh, okay, basically today, um, for attending today, um, the James R. West Center is providing complimentary CEUs. They're offered for licensed nurses, social workers, LPCs in Texas, um, or, the, or a certificate of attendance. Um, you must complete the entire live webinar to receive the CEUs today's CEU, today's um, attendance is worth one and a half CEU credits. You must also complete the survey monkey evaluation. Please note there's two different evaluations. Um, the survey monkey is required for a certificate of any kind. So please um, complete that. Um, and you can also complete that if you're not looking for a certificate. Um, the, I know they want your feedback just like we like it. We need your feedback. Um, the survey monkey evaluation will close um, on the 22nd of this month. Um, this should give her three to four weeks to get the certificates out. If you don't have them uh, um, within four weeks after the closing date, um, then, then feel free to check on it. But uh, but don't send an email a week from now, please, that, that's asking for your certificate. Since we go over this twice during each of the webinars, I'm pretty suspicious when I get emails a week from now saying, what do I need to do to get my certificate? I haven't got my certificate yet. So give her some time, please, um, and, and that's why we go over it now. Um, also, you will receive a link for a Google survey. 
The Google survey is our survey. It helps us report back on the goals and objectives that we set forth when we applied for funding to bring you these webinars. That should pop up as you uh, get out of Zoom today, or, or you should get a thing asking you if you'd like to complete the survey. If not, you will receive the survey um, in the follow-up email as well. There'll be two surveys. Um, if we can go to the last slide. And then, uh, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I did that. I went through all the work to put it, to get it all together, and and, and then I, I I I put the wrong one in there. I am so sorry. Give me just one second, um, because I don't remember off the top of my head what it is. Hold on, just one second. I'm so sorry. Um, it it is next month's topic is um a burnout and compassion fatigue. Yep. how to build resilience. And I will have that fit and send that out to you in the follow-up email. I am so sorry. Um, the, the other thing um, I want to make sure is I want to go over real quick again. We are doing a, um, a webinar later this month in Spanish on um, normal versus not normal aging. And, um, and so we have a hard time reaching those people because um, you all, most of the webinars we usually do are in English. So our email um, addresses are usually based on that. So if you could help us um, get that email out or that flyer out to anybody that that might serve. We don't have a lot of people signed up and we surely want to do these um, at, um, so that we're helping people. So that a link to the Spanish uh, flyer will also be in your follow-up email along with everything else. Jamie, was there anything in the questions that you wanted to address? Uh, great question. Um, There's a few in the Q&A. Okay. Um, I know, so Marty just addressed, there will be a um, recording of this sent out in the um, in the follow-up email, so you will have access to this. And I encourage all of you, their YouTube channel is a plethora of education. <laughs> so I follow the YouTube channel and all of his recordings and all of his programs, I mean, you have access to them, so. And, and underneath the recordings, the, now that'll go out in the second email. I send that out to everybody who registered. The first email will go only out to the people who attended. Um, I don't want to confuse them with the CEU information because because they can't get the CEUs for watching the recording. But um, but below the the um, the video on YouTube, you'll also see the link to to download the slides if they would like to take notes as they're watching the video. Um, I will say so. Um, somebody asked about depression and grief when you add into the mix. I would say with that, it's. Um, seeking professional help to make sure that the depression is being treated and managed well, but also knowing that grief is kind of a part of life. And so making sure that individual has the tools and the coping skills and the support to help them work through that depression. Um, and then somebody asked about a book on caring um, someone with dementia and how you can access that. There are so many books on caring for somebody with dementia. The yeah, first one that comes to mind is the, um, oh, the 36 hour day. Um, that can help with that. And, but I can also send a list of books that we have used um, just to help us, um, me personally, uh, but also professionally as well. Or we have a list of books on our website on jameselwest.org. There's a list of resources and helpful links too. And you are able, allowed to post the Spanish invite on your personal Facebook page, please. Um, just to get the word out there, um, we would greatly appreciate that. So. Um, and, and somebody asked where you'll get the survey for the, the survey monkey. That will go out in, in the follow-up email. I'm waiting for some information on another one, but that should go out either later today or tomorrow, the, 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 um, the first follow-up email, and that will have that in. Um, thank you. I, I think thank that's you. everything, isn't it? I think I got everything. I think you I got everything. Anyway, and, and if you're experiencing grief, please, um, please do not hesitate to um to reach out i mean I and mean, that's just really if you feel like you're in a in a stage where where jamie talked about please um don't hesitate to reach out i will also include a phone number for the uh, north central texas area agency on aging and the adrc um if you cannot find support 
please just call. They have a, a navigators to help you find that if, if, if one of the links Jamie's given you is, is not quite, um, um, it doesn't meet your need. Um, the uh, the YouTube channel is um, is um, um, in the email I send out at the bottom of the email underneath my contact information. You will see the um, the YouTube channel link, and that will get you to the YouTube channel. I think that's everything. Jamie, thank you, thank you, thank you. Incredible presentation. Mm -hmm. um, um, Obviously, if you look at the comments, lots of people. Thank you all for joining us today. We certainly appreciate it. You all have a wonderful day. And please help us spread the word about this recording and about any fu the future um, trainings we've got going. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.